So now that you've got the historical background, let's talk about the globalization of fashion. By 1900, mass production of some kinds of clothing had already begun. We talked about that with the Civil War. And haute couture provided original styles that were, that were copied. And gradually that mass production increased, um, starting first with uh, women's dresses, because that was our main um, garment, and with men's shirts. Although some American designers had gained some recognition in the years before World War I, they had not become very widely known or publicized by the popular press really until after World War II. So really at this point, um, you know, the war stopped. It closed off Paris uh, from the rest of the world. With Paris being cut off uh, from the world <laughs> through throughout World War I, a number of design centers emerged in countries around the world um, during the war and, and more so after the war. And Couture had to share the spotlight with emerging upscale and ready to wear designers. And, you know, Western fashion sometimes gained a foothold in areas where, where local ethnic dress had predominated. And sometimes those ethnic styles and Western fashions merged. Um, sometimes controversy <laughs> grew out of, of that desire for immigrants to maintain, you know, practices that were with their ethnic and religious backgrounds. But in order to, in my air quotes, fit in with regular society, they tended to want to dress more Western. Additional sources of, of media also emerged uh, in the in the early 20th 20th century. So we've talked about um, you know magazines going back and forth across the ocean, um, but for the beginning part of the century as well, you know the invention of motion pictures. When we get to it, television and the internet. But by the 1920s, motion pictures played a role in both urban and in rural areas. When leading actors and actresses um, wore contemporary clothing, they were seen by millions of individuals. So instantly, the, their style became became what was copied. And although some trends were um, trends began, you know, after they were seen in the movies, it's not entirely clear if the films introduced the styles or the styles were already introduced and just highlighted by the films that they were in. One thing that we need to, to take note of, um, especially for films that are set in historic periods, you know, while um, the garments can be trustworthy, right? The garments uh, usually are, are just uh, uh, are copied off of designs. Oftentimes the hair and makeup is not um, not that they don't reflect the period of, of that actual time. So we have to have to be careful when we're looking at period films. So keep that in mind when we get to our Getting Dressed um, series of videos at the end of this lecture. There is actually a, a video, a short clip uh, of a fashion, uh, not necessarily a fashion show, but um, styles being modeled for you to purchase. So basically like a video catalog um, from, 19, from a 1917 manufacturer. It's, it's a really interesting video. So we saw in... The, in the the article that we read, what shall we wear this year and next? That you know, the creation of fashion and the and the procurement of textiles really already was a global a global process. And you know, when you add to that magazines, catalogs, and motion pictures, this was the first time in recorded history that everybody in the world were looking at the same influences. The ready-to-wear industry in America by 1920 had expanded and become quite mature. And although there were still, you know, uh, women who sewed at home and made their dresses and, and folks who still went to custom, custom dressmakers and tailors, almost all Americans purchased at least some of the garments in their wardrobe as ready-made. And you know, that mass production and sale of ready-to-wear clothing was really dominated by middle-class American clothing consumption. Along with this globalization, or actually fueled by this globalization, is technological developments um, in, in, in fabric technology. And, you know, for centuries, the, the fabrics that were available were fabrics in, in nature. And, you know, 
although people in other parts of the world had used some, you know, unusual local materials, you know, Western society tended to use cotton, linen, silk, and wool. At the beginning of the 19th century, new fibers were created from from cellulose, um, known as artificial silk, and it didn't gain rapid accept, acceptance because it, it wasn't as luxurious and didn't wash wash well. But by 1924, that fiber um, was named by the National uh, Retail Dry Goods Association as rayon. And we know that is still a widely used fabric. Rayon in the, in the, in the terms that we would uh, like to use it, there actually are two versions of rayon um, that was created in the early part of the century. I'll give you the name in a second, but, um, you know, a second and quite different manufacturer fiber also came into use um, right after World War II. Originally, it was also called rayon, um, but in the 50s, it was given a a separate name as acetate to distinguish it from from actual rayon because rayon actually is a trademark title. Throughout the 1920s and increasingly into the 30s, rayon, so rayon and acetate, were used mostly in women's clothing. And in 1938, The DuPont company, yes, the DuPont that we know today, created the first nylon fibers. And they were um, shown at the 1939 World's Fair and quickly gained favor as a preferred fiber to use for women's underwear and women's stockings. Why? We still call them nylons. One of the other uh, technological advances that helped with the globalization and mass production of fashion was the means of closing a garment. So for, you know, we, for centuries, we've been seeing lacings, um, you know, and and then the, then buttons as well. But in 1891, um, Whitcomb Judson from Chicago invented the zipper. And the zipper was first called the clasp locker. The clasp locker (laughs) or zipper was actually improved, uh, was proved, um, because the original one would fall apart, uh, was improved by uh, Gideon Sunback, who went on to manufacture what was known as the hookless fasteners that were sold for corsets and gloves and, and sleeping bags. And by the time we get to 1920, um, those closures were transformed into what we now know as the zipper. The first zipper uh, were actually, well, Goodrich's version of the zipper um, was actually used for boots. The boots were actually called the zipper boot. And in 1925, um, the zipper was trademarked. And, you know, zippers are so widely used by the 1930s that uh, zipper just became the the generic term for any tooth slide fastener. So the, the term zipper itself is actually a trademark. By the time we get to the mid '30s, the zipper was uh, was well known, but it wasn't universally used. And uh, zipper manufacturers mounted campaigns to get men's trousers and suit manufacturers to use zippers in in the closure. And this uh, increased the considerable uh, effort to accomplish. And believe it or not, the Prince of Wales and his brother, the Duke of York, were instrumental in wearing zippered trousers. So this period, the beginning, the, the turn of the century to, to the, the 20th century, we saw the uh, introduction of the, the quick movement of fashion with, you know, magazines and brochures being shared across continents and countries, the invention of, of the movies that made everyone see um, fashions and some technological advances that helped fashion move forward.